I've always been fascinated by railways and by war. Probably mainly because Dad fought right through. From 1939, he was at Dunkirk, he was lucky to survive, he was at D-Day. The railways were an essential part of modern warfare. Hitler certainly knew it, and he raced from one country to the next to the next as he invaded most of Europe, using the railways to basically transport his troops at high speed. Each time they invaded a new country, they absorbed that country's railway system. So by the end, 1.6 million people were working on Hitler's Reichsbahn. What happened then was that this vast network was used for a much more sinister purpose. And it wasn't just one mad dictator. All these people helped to accelerate the complete destruction of the Jewish nation. The railway speeded things up, and over six million Jews, we know, were murdered in the Holocaust. I want to go across Europe to see what part the railways played in this evil plan. I want to go to the ghettos. I want to go to the death camps. I want to talk to experts. I want to talk to survivors of the Holocaust. It won't be an easy trip, but I do think that it's a terrible chapter in history that we should just never, ever forget. I'm starting my journey in the city where many believe the Holocaust began four years before the outbreak of World War II. This is the quaint medieval city of Nuremberg. It's so typically German, which is why Hitler chose it as the perfect backdrop for his own vision of nationalism. Every year, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe up to a million supporters of Hitler came here to witness the annual Nazi rally. And nearly all of them arrived on the train. Today, I want to see the site of the rallies. I want to find out how the railway was used to bring in the Nazi hordes, with the same methods that will be repeated for the mass deportation of Jews in the coming years. Puzzlingly, it was very difficult to get permission to go in here, but just look at the state of this place. Graffiti everywhere, dirt, what a tip. First, I'm visiting the abandoned station that was built just before the war to handle the extraordinary volume of people who travel to the rallies. This is very much the disused Bahnhof Marsfeld station. It was going to be the Nazis' ultimate station for taking Nazi supporters to the rallies. They had seven platforms, and the train would arrive here bringing people on their way to the rally, and they would then storm down there in their thousands down the subway. The idea was this subway would take tens of thousands of frantic Nazi supporters all the way along this tunnel to a specially designed camp for them at the end. The idea of using railways to transport thousands directly into camps would be adopted time and again during the Holocaust. Of course, those passengers wouldn't be baying Nazis, but imprisoned Jews. Once they'd set up camp, the masses would walk a few hundred yards to the rallies, which happened here, Zeppelin Field. It's really chilling to follow in the footsteps of Hitler and his adoring followers in the place where he made his ranting speeches of hate. Unser Deutschland sieht heil! Sieht heil! Sieht heil! There's something very eerie about standing here. This is the spot where Hitler addressed these huge rallies. There's always a giant swastika up there and tens and tens of thousands of worshippers out there, all in uniform, the SS, Hitler Youth. It's now a sports field, but I would not like to be here at night. It's really kind of spooky. I'm being joined by an expert on the history of the Nuremberg rallies. Alex. Hello. Chris, <laughs> how are you? How are fine, you? fine. Am I unusual? I find it really spooky standing here, that, that Hitler was here ranting away at everybody. Yes, it's, it's really spooky. You yeah. can't actually imagine. Yeah. Can you? Just here. here. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> ah. How many people would have come? 200,000. Would you say it was a preparation for war? It was a preparation for war, because the people here learned to follow the leader, and the railway learned 
to transport a huge crowd to a place here in an exact time. Yeah. So this was also useful for the war, for, to transport soldiers to the front. But was not that the same knowledge used for transporting Jews to the Holocaust? Yes, they learned to transport in a very fast way. Every train has to have 1,000 people. It's exactly the same number as deportation trains. So without railway, there's no party rally, there's no war and no Holocaust. In 1935, Hitler chose the Nuremberg rallies to announce the first anti-Jewish laws. Overnight, Jews lost all citizenship rights and were banned from marrying non-Jews. These racist Nuremberg laws were just the start. It's difficult to imagine why Hitler actually hated the Jews so deeply. In his autobiography, Mein Kampf, there were all sorts of contradictory statements by Hitler. But he did say one very revealing thing. He said the elimination of the Jews would necessarily be a bloody process. Whatever Hitler had in mind, the railway would play a critical role as discrimination evolved into segregation, deportation, and eventually genocide. I'm following the path of Hitler's railway as he used it to achieve the first of his goals, to expand the Reich. In 1938, Hitler was preparing for war, and he couldn't do that without an effective railway. So he used the Reich farm to quickly transport thousands of troops to occupy Austria and the area that I'm going into today. My journey is going to take me across Europe to the ghettos and death camps of Poland. First, I'm travelling from Nuremberg into what was then Czechoslovakia to the capital, Prague. On the way, I'm passing through the country's mountainous perimeter, the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland was populated mainly by ethnic Germans, and Hitler felt this gave him a right to claim it for the Reich. The British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and other European leaders were anxious to avoid war at all costs. So they met in Munich to thrash out a deal and listen to Hitler's territorial claims. Pathetically, they agreed to all his demands and handed all these lands over without any sign of fight. The really scandalous thing about the Munich Agreement is that the Czechs were not invited to the conference at all. Neville Chamberlain said that the agreement would bring peace for our time. But for many living in the Sudetenland, only bad times lay ahead. In autumn 1938, the countdown to war had begun as Hitler annexed the Sudetenland. Sudeten opponents of the Nazis left their homes and poured into what was left of Czechoslovakia. In Prague, teams of volunteers were working hard to find escape routes for those most at risk. There was a huge refugee problem and a growing fear that the Nazis just might take over the rest of the country. But in this part of town, there were one or two hotels where they were compiling secret lists of the most vulnerable people who needed to get out of this country, and quick. One of the volunteers was a British academic who stayed in this hotel. Doreen Warriner had come to Prague to help political refugees but ended up playing a significant role in rescuing Jewish children. She drew up lists of thousands of men and women who would almost certainly be killed if they fell into Nazi hands. She arranged trains and visas for them to get to the UK and even accompanied some of them on the journey. Warner worked tirelessly and often ended her day in this very hotel bar with a stiff tomato juice. But in January 1939, her drink was interrupted by disturbing news that would jeopardise her work. 
One night, a party of Germans were laughing, drinking, obviously celebrating, but a pale young Jewish barman looked positively worried. When Warrener asked him, why are the Germans so happy? He said, because they are coming for Czechoslovakia next. And she said, when? And he said, March. That shocking prediction came true on the 15th of March. Hitler's ambitions hadn't stopped with the Sudetenland. He wanted all of Czechoslovakia. Czech Jews lost their rights, and Warrener was inundated with families who were desperate to get out. Britain promised to help, but there were strings attached. The British Home Office agreed to take some children in, but there were a number of conditions. They had to be under 17. The parents had to stump up 50 pounds, which was an absolute fortune in those days. And foster homes had to be found and guaranteed in Britain. That meant children had to be separated from their parents. Max Spitzer and his wife Pavla made this painful decision and applied for their three daughters to be transported to Britain. The youngest, Zuzana, was only seven. Nearly 80 years on, I'm meeting Zuzana on the platform from where she left for England in July 1939. The modern station's so noisy, we've moved to the staterooms next door to see an extraordinary home movie her father made days after the Nazis invaded. Now we've got the swastika, That's haven't the we, castle. when the Germans took over? Yes. My father filmed that secretly, you know. He took uh, films of the guards, the Germans, outside the castle. Mm. If they had caught him, they would have shot him. I, I don't understand that he didn't realise that. Look, there's the change of the guard. Uh, Germans in the Czech castle. That is something mm. terrible. Terrible. Nobody really seemed to have any idea then just how bad it was going to become. No. I think uh, people, they didn't want to believe it at the beginning that there was danger, but stories seeped through and they started to be afraid. Unbeknown to Zuzana, an associate of Doreen Warrener's was planning her rescue. Nicholas Winton was a stockbroker who volunteered to help by arranging trains and foster homes in Britain for children like Susanna and her sisters. When we got on the train, one of the most poignant memories is looking out of the train window onto the platform and seeing all those adult people crying, and we didn't know why. We didn't know why they're crying, but it was contagious, and. We started crying. Nicholas Winton is remembered on the platform from where his trains departed. Commemorating the 669 children he rescued from almost certain death. It's a beautiful sculpture. They look so sad, don't they? Little, little girl, beautiful little girl, obviously separated from her parents. This little boy just clinging on to anybody. It's very moving. He looks such a kind man as well. Zuzana and her sisters were later reunited with their parents in the UK and survived the Holocaust. But most of the children who waved goodbye to their parents never saw them again. On the 1st of September, 1939, any hope of further rescue trains to Britain came to an abrupt end when Hitler invaded Poland. The borders were closed and Britain declared war on Germany. It would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honourable settlement between Germany and Poland, but Hitler would not have it. I want to find out how the outbreak of war affected the Jews who hadn't escaped Prague and were now completely at the Nazis' mercy. This train is taking me 40 miles north of Prague, but I'm hoping to meet an extraordinary lady who wants to tell me about the terrifying journey she took 77 years ago. Good morning. Good morning. Are you Helga? Nice. Hello. Nice to meet I'm you. Chris. 
You look very smart. Thank you. Helga Weissova was the daughter of a prosperous banker until her family and all of Prague's Jews were forced to give up their homes and wealth and herded onto trains to live in a ghetto. Helga, what do you remember of this journey 77 years ago? I remember everything. There are things I cannot forget. But I remember how we traveled the time, but it was not such a nice day. It was cold, snow. It was December 1941. Yeah. I was 12. They were SS men and they were screaming on us and they gave us orders how to do and all the time, hurry, hurry along. Helga and I are taking the same journey she and her family took in 1941 to a garrison town called Terezin. When you started your journey, what did you think it would be like at the other end? We were perhaps a little naive. They told us we will be somewhere concentrated in a ghetto. We didn't expect the war would be so long, yeah. and so we suppose somehow we would survive it. What were you allowed to take with you to bring? It was very few things. We were allowed to take 50 kilo luggage. 50 kilo luggage is not so much. Mm. I was very fond of drawing since my childhood, so I put inside my luggage a box of watercolors, some crayons and some paper. We're arriving at the station where Helga disembarked. It's nearly two miles from the Terrazin camp. Yeah, be very careful. I'm carrying your handbag. OK? And this is the same... Is that the same station building as I when think, you came? I think so. From here, we had to walk to Terezin. How far was that? Three kilometres. Three kilometres? And was it cold? It was cold and it was snow. So there was snow everywhere. You'd have been freezing. It was in December. Yeah. It's a long way. Yes. The prisoners were forbidden to keep records of their time in Terezin. But this didn't stop Helga from using the pens and papers she packed to keep a diary, which she illustrated with drawings like this one of the prisoners walking to the camp. A bumpy road and a saw. Our heavy feet sink into the mud and dirty yellow water squirts out from beneath the carriages laden with luggage. We learn lots of unpleasant things. The worst is that men and women live separately. Everybody who was able to walk had to walk. Yeah. Some old or ill or carried. So this is coming up to terrace, isn't it? Mm. So we are inside. Mm. Terrazin suited the Nazis' purpose. As a former garrison town, it was separate from other settlements, with a clear perimeter to prevent the inhabitants escaping. Before the war, 7,000 people lived here, but the Nazis threw them out, so more than eight times that number of Jews could be crammed into the same space. Always the memories come back. I recognize the buildings. Is this the original door? Yes, this was the entrance we came inside. But only women. Women and men were separated. My father was sent somewhere else, but we didn't yet know where. So you and your mother must have been very worried about your father, well, what was happening? You no, know, we were, sure we were. We weren't allowed to go outside. Helga's painting of the corridor inside the barracks gives a flavour of how grim life was. The little girl in the makeshift bed has tuberculosis. Which one do you think was your window, your dormitory? Somewhere here. Locked in the building, Helga sketched the view of the courtyard. But one day, this would be the scene of unspeakable cruelty, when the SS caught nine boys who tried to send letters to their mothers. 
I remember this moment. It was terrible because we were not allowed to go out, but we watched it. It was one of the worst moments. My hand is trembling so much from just thinking about it. We saw a small group in the front and the rear were the SS. In the middle, nine young men with shovels on their shoulders so they could dig their own graves. Nine condemned to death. What did these boys do that was so terrible to be dealt with so cruelly? And they were hanged here. They only wanted to let their parents know they are alive. Helga witnessed the hangings from a small room shared with 20 others. Cramped, three-tier bunk beds, some sort of a bucket for basic washing. Bed bugs, lice, all sorts of disease. Can't imagine thousands of people living in conditions like this for several years. And of course, every single one of them had to wear the Jewish Star of David. Did you have many people sick? Of course. In such conditions, epidemic broke up and there was a lot of infections. So we did our best, but of course, many people died every day. In 1943, the railway was extended directly into the camp. But this wasn't to make the Jews' journey into Terezin easier. The trains arrived to take the Jews away to a place rumored to be even worse, a camp called Auschwitz. Did you, in this camp, have any real idea what was happening in camps like Auschwitz? We didn't know. We hoped uh, or believed that it would be a new ghetto similar to Terezin. Or maybe better. No, we didn't suppose didn't it think would that. be better. We supposed it would be worse, yeah. but we did, had no idea that it would be so terrible as it yeah. was. Yeah. Helga lived in fear of being selected for transport, which often happened at night. Her diary recalls the moment her father Otto was selected and saying goodbye before he was forced onto a train. Your eyes glittered strangely and your hand shook as you pressed me to yourself for the last time. What did it mean? Goodbye or farewell? Daddy, did you believe we'd ever meet again? Did you ever find out what happened to your father? We never know where he died, but probably he went directly to Auschwitz and directly to Gestchamber. So nobody noticed his name anywhere. So the last stop is when he left Terezin. Mm. My father was 46. Terrible. Bless you. Five days after her father left, Helga and her mother were also transported to Auschwitz. Most of the deportees would be murdered on arrival. But miraculously, Helga and her mother survived. Amazingly, also, her pictures and her diary survived. They were bricked into a wall by her uncle after she left these barracks. The railway brought 150,000 prisoners to Terezin. 33,000 died here, and many more died in Auschwitz. By 1941, the Nazis' approach had changed from persecuting Jews at home to deporting them to ghettos like Terezin. Hitler's propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, wrote of the policy in his diary. He wrote, the Fuhrer is of the opinion that the Jews must be removed from all of Germany. Berlin is the first in line, and I am hopeful that in the course of this year, we are able to transport a substantial part of Berlin's Jews to the east. And in order to achieve this aim, of course, you'd need trains and lots of them. I've come to Berlin to meet a rabbi and Holocaust railway expert 
who can help me understand the sheer scale of the Nazi railway infrastructure built for the war. Starting with the Kriegslok, the war locomotive. God, that is just enormous, isn't it? What is that? You're the train lock. Well, the technical term would be a Kriegslok Type 1, which was built for war purposes. The tender is a special design for the war, designed to have fewer man hours involved in making it. It's just half of an oil wagon cut in half, really. And they were built in the thousands for conveying whatever needed to be conveyed. I mean, obviously, tanks and ammunitions and troops. But also people. people. Also people. They were built by slave labor. They were built in Austria, in Poland, in Skoda, in Pilsen. Uh, in other words, the, the Germans got occupied countries building exactly the same type. So they would have had slave labor mm. building the locomotives to take... Of course. To take Jews... With a totalitarian system. To the camps. Yes. You didn't have a choice. That's a horrible thought. It's a very horrible thought. You do get a sense of the scale of this massive locomotive. Look, I'm six foot two. And I'm still miles under just this bit. Look at that up there. It's just huge. Wait. This old battle relic wasn't built to last. Nimble as an antelope. But such is the quality of the engineering and the preservation work of enthusiasts that of the 7,000 that were built, about 30 of these locomotives still run. This one takes people on what are described as cultural excursions out into the countryside. It all feels rather odd and I have to assume that at least some of the people on board have very little idea about the Kriegslok's history as an instrument of war, and particularly of the Holocaust. It's full of people, but of course, in the 1940s, it would have been so, so different. Today, they just seem to be rejoicing. But in actual fact, there are over a 1,000 on each train. They would have been travelling in converted cattle trucks. There would have been one window, one toilet, it would have been so, so different. Since I started out on this journey, I've been struggling with a question. A question about the Holocaust that perhaps only a rabbi can answer. Why do you think it happened? What was the point of it? I'm sorry, there you get me. There is no answer. The people I fear are those who have answers. I think a lot of life in Judaism, especially, is a religion with a lot of questions. And I really believe in asking questions, and I fear those who have answers, because those who have answers stop asking questions. I still have plenty of questions, like how could the Reichsbahn, which employed more than a million people, collude with the Nazis to deport so many Jews? Did all those train workers know what they were doing? Did they know where they were taking the Jews? Or what would happen to them? Did civilian Germans know what was happening? These days, this is a memorial, but in 1941, it was a huge synagogue. But the Lefetovstrasse synagogue's days as a place of worship were over. The Nazis decided that it should be a transit camp where Jews would be ordered to report before they were deported. Thousands of Jews camped here, often for several days in quite appalling conditions, until one day they were told their train was ready and their new home was waiting. What would have been particularly degrading, I think, is that many of the Jews would have come from very smart homes, they would have been very wealthy, and most of this walk, this great march to the station, is through a really well-to-do area. But no one seems to have seen anything. There isn't a single eyewitness account of Jews being led to this station and Platform 17. This part of the station clearly hasn't been used for many years. Look at the trees now growing up between the sleepers. I can almost feel the ghosts of the 50,000 Jews who were deported from Berlin. Their humiliation complete, 
when they were forced to pay for their own one-way tickets. Since 1991, this platform has been a memorial with a plaque commemorating each transport. So this is the very first train, the very first one that transported the Jews from here. 18th of October, 1941, 1251, 1,251 Juden, Jews, were transported from Berlin, which is Grunewald, where we are, Grunewald, Berlin, to a city 300 miles east from here in Poland, Lodz. I do think they're looking around all this, and it's beautifully done. How many people actually ever notice this memorial? Trains no longer run from Grunewald station to Poland. So I'm going to take the modern route via Berlin's plush main station. I'm heading to Poland to follow the path of the Jews who were transported there in 1941. That path will take me 300 miles east to Lodge. But first I want to stop off at a place called Guniezno to look at the remains of a vast train yard that was built as part of Hitler's plans to conquer the East. Operation Barbarossa was the code name for the invasion of the Soviet Union. In Mein Kampf, Hitler wrote, the German people needed more space and he wanted to form German territories in the Ukraine. What India was for England, he wrote, the territories of Russia will be for us. In June 1941, Nazi stormtroopers entered the Soviet Union. They shot dead around a million Jews and communists in cold blood. These massacres marked a new phase in the Holocaust, euphemistically called the final solution to the Jewish question. But Hitler had a problem. The Soviet Union was enormous, far bigger than anywhere he'd invaded before. To maintain the assault, he'd need huge railway projects to keep the supply lines of men and weapons intact. I've come to Gunyezno to see one of the extraordinary structures that made the invasion of the Soviet Union possible. Oh, you can see it just over there. It's a massive Nazi rail yard. At its height, 3,000 people worked here, many of whom were Jewish prisoners. Today, it's a deserted ghost town, a vast, crumbling relic of the war. It's something like three miles long from top to bottom, and it would have been heaving with armoured cars, jeeps, personnel carriers, and, of course, thousands of men, all pouring up to the Russian front. This 450-yard siding with its water pumps, sand toppers, this giant crane for lifting coal could refuel 12 locomotives at the same time. Incredibly, 24 engines would have been in those sheds at any one time. And this, pretty rusty, but nearly 80 years since it first worked, this turntable, still actually works. So one bloke can actually turn a 110-tonne locomotive. It still works. It does. <laughs> Throughout this depot, there are reminders that here in Poland, more than 150,000 Poles and Jews were forced to work for Hitler's railway. In Boston, a lot of the rails in this workshop, you can see the famous brand name Krupp, big, massive German steel and ammunition company. After the war, the Krupps were found guilty at the Nuremberg trials of war crimes and the use of slave labour. I suppose Hitler was fighting two wars, one against the Allies and the Russians and one against the Jews, but without the Jewish and Polish slave labour, 
this place would never have been built. And without this railway depot, there wouldn't have been the trains or the rolling stock or any of the infrastructure to invade Russia. And in the end, this whole place says it all about whatever did happen to the Nazis' idea of world domination. But in 1941, the threat was still very real, and the railway was central to the Nazis' plan of getting rid of the Jews. I've reached Radagast station in Lodge, where 1,200 Berlin Jews arrived in October 1941 to be concentrated with other Jews in the ghetto. This is the first place where the Jews heading for the Lodge ghetto would have actually have emerged. Basically, the deportees, maybe even tens of thousands, would have all arrived here. They would have made their way a few hundred yards up there to what they were promised with new homes and lots of work. But it was a lie. Nearly a thousand such ghettos were set up across the Reich. They were places of death and horror. Like most ghettos, Lodge was created next to a railway station. A perimeter was built to keep the inhabitants segregated from the rest of the city's population. Just two fenced-off roads ran across the ghetto for the convenience of non-Jews to pass through. The tram route that ran down one of those roads still operates today, and I can get a bit of a sense of what the ghetto must have been like. Now, this green area here is where the Germans raised this whole bit of the city to the ground to make sure they had a gap between the Germans and the Jews. There were wooden fences all the way along this route, and 164,000 people were crammed into this one and a half square mile area. So little has changed that it's easy to picture what life was like. The wooden footbridge was built so the ghetto's inhabitants couldn't access the road. Overcrowded, overworked, full of disease. Nazi police had orders to shoot anyone who approached the perimeter. This fairly innocuous looking building that's now a chemist, that was actually the guest staff at headquarters. This morning, I have an appointment with an incredible man who survived the horrors of this place. A man who cheated death so many times, it's remarkable that he's here to tell me his story. I'm in a part of the Polish city of Lodz that once was a horrific, overcrowded and brutal ghetto. Arek Hirsch was still a child when he arrived. He'd already been orphaned by the Nazis. And he'd worked as a slave building the railway. What age were you when the Germans had you working on the railway? Um, they took me, I was 11 years old. So a little boy, uh, yes, really? That's, that's all I was. How did the people working on the railway handle their situation? Um, they were very, very badly treated. Many people jammed under the train as it passed by, got killed, and I, I had to bury them. So you were still a little boy, and yeah. you were scraping up body parts yeah. and... Yes, I had to do that. Oh, dear. And people were hanged, I had to bury them as well. Uh, we started with 2,500 men. Within 18 months, when our railway line was finished, there was only 11 people left alive. 11? 11. In his previous ghetto, 80 members of Arek's family and extended family had been taken away and murdered. Arek was now 12 years old and all alone in a place where he witnessed death every day. There were three hospitals and just one day the SS came 
and they threw the bodies from the first floor and the second floor onto trucks. What, people from the hospital? Yes. Were some uh, alive? Were they yes. alive? They're still alive and they, they killed them. They emptied all the hospitals? Yes. Why? No idea. And you saw dead bodies all the time? All the time. There were carts, they took bodies away from the street. People used to drop in the street, but the children used to drop in the street, died for malnutrition. These sick crimes are almost unimaginable, but the city's Jewish cemetery says it all. Most of those who died in the lodge ghetto are buried in these paupers' graves. 43,000 people are buried here, and that's just people who died in this lodge ghetto. And then on the walls are the people who were taken from the ghetto and killed. And I've never seen this. The word murder is everywhere. Grandmother Esther murdered in 1942. Mother murdered in Auschwitz, 44. Sister murdered in Treblinka. Brother murdered. The whole Talmud family murdered during the war. I've never seen anything like this, and all because of one evil little maniac. Perhaps most sinister of all was that many of those who died were selected for death not by the Nazis, but by fellow Jews. The Nazis forced this council of elders to select people to be relocated from the ghetto. They probably had no idea of the fate that awaited the people they'd chosen. In September 1942, Arek heard rumours that he might be chosen next, so he fled to a cemetery to hide. Um, first of all, the president of the ghetto, he asked her parents to hand over 10,000 children. And what parents would hand over to know that they're going to be killed? Nobody did. A lot of the parents uh, hid their children and uh, and a lot of parents were killed when the SS found the children hiding. Yeah. And I hid behind a tombstone and was praying to God, let them not catch me because I was the age group yeah. for me to be taken away. If the SS found children hiding, what did they do? They shot them. The next evil chapter in the Holocaust was being written. And if Arek was going to live, he'd have to hide among the dead. As he hid, thousands of children and adults were rounded up, marched to Radagast station and taken deep into the countryside. The man who chose to transport the children here was one of the greatest criminals of the Holocaust, SS Sturmbannfuhrer Herbert Langer. He already had form for murdering mental patients for the Reich, and now he was going to turn his attention to the Jews. Langer chose this remote area with a small population and dense forest that allowed him to operate in secret. There was also the convenience of a narrow-gauge railway. It's really hard to imagine, but this is actually the end of the narrow-gauge railway that brought them here. From here, they were loaded into these lorries. You can see the German soldiers very gently moving everybody into the trucks. See, it's all very calm. They have no idea what's ahead. They think they're going to rest and then go on to work in a new place. These are actually some sort of fruit and veg truck, forerunner of the cattle trucks that were to follow. But at the moment, nobody has a clue that anything untoward is going to happen. And that calmness has been deliberately created by the Nazis. The prisoners were taken to a mansion on the edge of a village called Helmno. Here they would be met by a commandant who greeted them with a reassuring welcome. This place gives me the creeps. You have to imagine it with a great big high wooden fence all the way around and barbed wire on the top of that. But there is a beautiful church over there looking down on the valley. There was a granary over there. And then all this was a magnificent mansion. 
that the Germans blew up when they'd finally completed their work. It's now an archaeological site where historians are piecing together the camp's modus operandi. Up to 100 people at a time would come through here, down these steps, hand over all their valuables and actually get a receipt for them. Then they would go into a much larger room here. They would remove their clothes. There would be cynically reassuring signs everywhere saying things like bedrooms, bathrooms, and they would go down into the basement for a bath. They would then come down at this narrow corridor, which, as you can see, is being excavated at the moment. And at that point, all pretense would suddenly stop. They were forced along this narrow corridor here with rifle butts and whips, raced along the corridor. They were pushed up a ramp here into vans, and the doors were slammed shut. These were no ordinary vans. They were hermetically sealed with heavy bolts on the doors. Gas from canisters and from the van's exhaust was pumped into the trailer. In a matter of minutes, everyone inside was dead. And once the bodies had been stripped of any remaining valuables, they were dumped somewhere in the nearby forest. This was an experimental camp where the Nazis learned how to murder efficiently and in huge numbers. This was the first actual death camp, wasn't it? No work or anything, just, just death. It was the first death camp that Germans established in occupied Poland. It was the first place where the gas was uh, used for mass killing the Jews. We know the time from arrival to death, it was about uh, one hour. I'm really struggling to get my head around this. I've been to genocide sites in Rwanda. You see blood on the walls, a little child shoe, and yet here, there's nothing really to see, and yet you know what happened. The commandant making his welcome speech about 10 times a day to a, another truckload of Jews that he knew were going to die within a matter of minutes. Something like, I don't know, 200, maybe even 300,000 people died in this site. 100,000 people died probably, were gassed where I'm standing now. That's a horrible thought. Behind a tombstone 60 miles away in Lodge, a terrified orphan was still in hiding. Arek's quick wits had saved him from being murdered at Helmno, but now he had to concentrate on staying alive. When he felt the danger was over, he snuck back into the ghetto and looked for a new place to live. He moved into this orphanage here for two more years, but by 1944, the war looked like it was beginning to turn against Germany. About 180 children were here. But it's still part of the ghetto? Yes. In the road over there, that was the way, the way it was. Guards? Yes. With guns? The SS? Yes. And what did you do here? Did you have a job of any sort? Yes. I used to work in a factory. Yeah. It was a textile mill. So what did you do? I used to help the mechanic. They took me to learn about the machinery. And um, I also did a bit of weaving from time to time. By 1944, yes. did you kids start to get a sense that maybe the war we, we was turning? We had that feeling that the war was turning. It came through from certain people. I think they had radios. So we knew in 1944 that the Germans are losing. They were already, the Russians were already in Warsaw, uh, which is not so far away. No. But Arek's hopes of liberation were suddenly dashed when the Nazis decided to liquidate the ghetto and unleash new horrors on its inhabitants. In August 1944, the Nazis cleared the Lodge ghetto. Over three weeks, 68,000 inhabitants were marched to Radigast station for a journey on the railway of death. 
When people think about the Holocaust, this is the image that most of them conjure up. Line after line of cattle trucks crammed with desperate people inside. And one of the reasons why they use these boxcars was because so much of their rolling stock was tied up with the war effort. This was all that was left. So this is how you travel? Yeah. Yeah, dear, right, dear. That was our journey. Barbed wire on the window? Yeah. But nobody's going All to the windows had barbed wire. But nobody's going to escape anyway, are they? Well... How are you going to get out of that? You couldn't, but uh, they put barbed wire on to make sure that we don't. What was it like? I just think it must have been... Horrific. Yeah. Yes. A hundred people standing, you couldn't even sit down. One lavatory, one bucket. One bucket, yes, in a, in a blanket to cover it. Cover your modesty. Yeah. Did anybody die during the journey? One person. Who was that? A woman. Uh, she collapsed, but uh, the train just went on and nobody took any notice of it. She kept her on the corner and that was it. Arik has agreed to retrace the terrifying journey he took in August 1944 with 184 other orphans. From Lodz to a town in southern Poland called Oswiecim. Back then, this was a busy, centrally located railway junction with lines stretching all over Nazi Europe. They were used to transport over a million Jews and other prisoners to this area. I was worried because they told us we're going to work in factories. Yeah. So I didn't know what to expect. When you first all arrived, even though you'd been cramped for two days and you were starving, can you remember what your first impressions were? I looked to a crack of the train and noticed a salesman with dogs. That got me worried right away, because I knew the most horrendous people uh, were waiting for us. Oh, take it easy. It's a long way down. Yeah, take it easy. When Arik passed through here, he would have been in trucks similar to these. Exhausted, hungry, anxious, and oblivious to what awaited him just a mile up the line. From this footbridge, you can see this is such a focal point. So many railway lines converge on this one spot. And that's one of the main reasons why the Nazis chose this place for the largest of all their death camps. The Poles call it Oswiecim. The Germans call it Auschwitz. There were actually over 40 different Auschwitz camps, the two largest being the original Auschwitz and the colossal Auschwitz-Birkenau. Bogusław Starczewski is a veteran of the Polish railway. Hi, I'm Chris. How are you? Bogusław. Good. Pleased to meet you. He spent his life studying the rail network in this region. It's so overgrown now, but this would be the line that thousands of Jews came going towards the gas chambers. To, co jeszcze istniejące tory, po których już się nie jeździ, prowadziły one do obozu koncentracyjnego w Birkenau. Up an abandoned siding 500 yards from the camp is the Juden ramp, the ramp of the Jews. Where we are now is, is this what they call Juden ramp. Until 1944, the wagons would stop here and the Jews could be herded on foot to the camp. But then the Nazis forced the prisoners to build this spur. Od połowy 1944 roku od maja została wybudowana tak zwana bocznica prowadząca bezpośrednio do obozu Birkenau do samego obozu i tam yeah. Arek's packed cattle truck would have travelled along this spur and eventually through a gate 
that has become one of the Holocaust's most infamous sites. It's called the Gate of Death because virtually everybody who traveled along this track and went through that gate was murdered. At its peak in 1944, in just eight weeks, over 430,000 Jews went through that gate and hardly any of them were ever seen again. Birkenau is where the lessons learned in Nuremberg, in the ghettos and at Helmno were combined with unprecedented evil and efficiency. It's an enormous place and the scale of what the Nazis actually did is still pretty colossal. The women's quarters are over there on the left, the men's quarters are over there on the right. Now those are the ones who were selected to work, but the rest, the very young, the very old and the sick, have already gone to the end of the platform up there to the gas chambers. As the arrivals disembarked on this platform, they'd be subjected to selection. This was overseen by Dr. Joseph Mengele, known as the Angel of Death. His team chose between life, death, or being sent for cruel medical experiments. Arek and the other children from the orphanage were too young for work, so it seemed certain to Arek at least they'd be selected for death. The train stopped there yeah. on this line and we walked towards three high-ranking officers. They stood here. Because one of them was, we now know, was Mengele. Mengele, wasn't it? yes. So yes. what did Mengele and co do at that point? They picked you to die or live. This side, you died. They selected women, children, old men, and all those people went to this side. That got me frightened, and I've got to try and find a, a way out. What did you do? Yeah. I had a commotion with a child. A mother had the child on their arm, and they wanted the mother, they didn't want the baby. And she didn't want to get the baby and She up. started screaming. The moment they tried to pull the child, and she screamed. And this is the time when basically I got stuck in the middle here for a few seconds because yeah. they didn't know what was going on here. In the confusion, 14-year-old Arik approached an SS officer and thought up a lie. Uh, one of the officers asked me how old I am. Yeah. So I, I told him a lie. I said 17. And I told him that I was a locksmith. Which you weren't. Never, never was, you know. Never. Why did you pluck locksmith? I, I just thought the locksmiths, the mechanical, anything mechanical, yeah. the Germans wanted and so on. But uh, he told me to go to this side. And all the others went left? All of them went. There were about 182 children. From the orphanage? From the orphanage. Yeah. And they were all sent to this side. So your friends? Oh, everybody. You never saw any of them again? No. No. Arek didn't know where his friends had been taken. He was alone again, surviving in a world even more hostile than before. Starvation was going on all the time. Yeah. Uh, grass, you see grass now. There wasn't a blade of grass here. People picked it and cooked it. You know, it was a, a death machine here. Mm. It was the most advanced and fearsome ship the Nazis ever built. The Bismarck wasn't only a military weapon, it was also a status symbol of German sea power. So how did the Royal Navy defeat this monster of the sea? Bismarck, Hitler's great warship, Wednesday at 9 on Channel 5. Arek had saved himself from certain death by lying about his age. He now had to live as an adult in a men's barracks with up to 500 others. After you've been selected for work, yeah. what happened then? Head shaved, um, had a shower, yeah. and um, got clothing. Yeah, oh, this is the striped pyjamas. The striped pyjamas, yes. Yeah. And um, 
you got a pair of clogs. Yeah. Tattoo? And you get the tattoo then, the, the number? And the tattoo on the number, yes. Mm. Uh, and I got the uh, B7608. Which you must remember all your life, every day you left that number. Every day I... And do they ever call you by your name or do they just call you by your number? That's the number. So you were just a number? The, my name, name has been lost here mm. altogether. And... Um, so it's just... It's yeah, just planks, We slept it? on the wood, yes. No mattress. Sheets? No sheet, no. Pillow? No pillow. We just took our clothes off, wound the trousers around, put it on our head. And that's that how it. we slept. And how many of you in here? About ten people on each bunk. What was it like at night time? People snored, people cried, people coughed from all the beds. It was dreadful. Grief. Can you imagine? No, I can't. Did people die during the night? Many people. Yeah? Yes. Every morning uh, they had a car and collected the bodies. Oh. So Did you sometimes find yourself lying next to somebody you thought, I think this person's died beside me? I've had quite a few situations like that, but um, that's how it went every day. Sometimes it seems like every detail you give me is, is worse than the last one. Well, that was life here. As Eric struggled to survive, Every day, more and more trains arrived, bringing more Jews to their deaths. I think it's amazing that Eric's come back to Auschwitz at all, but I certainly wouldn't expose him to this next bit. If he turned left instead of right, he'd have come here. It's the gas chamber. Because you know the history of this place and what happened in there, it's just almost beyond belief. You can see where the, the gas would have been dropped in. You can imagine them screaming, terrified, gasping for air, desperate to get out, fighting over each body to try and get that last little gasp of air. It's just monstrous. The dead would have then been loaded into these furnaces and incinerated. The chimneys were burning. There were four chimneys burning day and night. So did you, when you saw that, that black smoke coming out of the chimneys, did, did you know what it was? No. Somebody told me, these are the gas chambers and these are the crematoriums that killed the people that arrived here. But the Nazis' grip was weakening. By January 1945, the Soviet Red Army was advancing on southern Poland and Auschwitz. Did you begin to think just maybe the war was coming to an end? Yes. We've seen about 500 planes, bombers fly low. Over Auschwitz? Over Auschwitz, yes. And also we've seen tanks going back on the way to Germany. So it looks like they're leaving Poland? Yes. We could hear a Russian artillery from a distance. On the 27th of January 1945, the Russians finally liberated Auschwitz and were horrified at what they found. Prisoners were helped to freedom, but Eric wasn't among them, because a few days earlier, the SS had started evacuating the prisoners at gunpoint. So they just took you out the camp? Yes, uh, minus 25 degrees. Snow? Heavy snow. snow, heavy snow. And we were in pyjamas and in clogs. And we marched. And they say we're taking you to a different camp. How many people are we talking about? Hundreds. 
I mean, everybody would have been very weak by then. They People were. Would fall by the wayside. And the body which couldn't walk was shot in the back of the head, and the body was thrown on the side of the road. And what did you have as supplies? Did you have food? Did you have water? What did you have? No, absolutely nothing. The Germans were in retreat, which meant fewer and fewer camps were available. For three months, Arik and thousands of other Auschwitz prisoners were moved from camp to camp. This remarkable amateur footage shows Auschwitz prisoners in coal trucks. They were being evacuated west through Czechoslovakia. What do you remember about your last journey? They put us onto a train, open wagons, yeah. no roofs, and we ate grass, we cooked grass, and uh, I also ate my shoe. You ate your shoe? And I cut it and I uh, burned the leather. And well, that, the, was, that was food? That somehow yes, sustained yes, you, eating yes, a shoe? Yeah, just bits of leather. And um, So you were desperate by yeah. that? Very desperate. They gave us no food. Most people died on the journey. Mm. Arek's final rail journey was in April 1945 from another concentration camp in Germany. He was sent on a train with 3,000 others for a month. Only 600 survived. Arek somehow ended up in Terezin, Czechoslovakia. And from there, he was liberated by the Russians on the 8th of May, 1945. It was a miracle Arek survived, but six million others didn't. For a few terrible years, these were the railways of death. This was a chapter in human history that must never be repeated and never, ever forgotten. Tomorrow afternoon, Timothy Bottoms and Martin Shaw star in the thrilling Operation Daybreak at 4.15. Next on Channel 5, the story of the first man in US history to receive the American Medal of Honor without firing a shot. Hacksaw Ridge, in just a moment. <laughs>